What's up, everyone, and welcome back to Relish the Journey. As always, I am your host, Miles Biggs, and our guest today has been featured on ABC, NPR, Fox, CBS. She's been featured in print by Men's Health, Women, Glamour, People, Time, Shape. Clients include places like Whole Food Markets. This is quite an impressive person. We're going to talk all about health, about stress, what you can control, what you can't control, and plenty of actionable insights coming your way right now. So let's just dive in and get started. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. I'm really excited to be here. So for people in the world out there, believe it or not, I'm sure some people still haven't heard of Kathy uh, Groover. So what do you? what's your elevator pitch? How do you introduce yourself? What are you known for? that we should introduce the world? Oh, geez, it sort of depends on what time of day you catch me. Um, <laughs> I'm everything from a massage therapist, a hypnotherapist, a coach. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an author. So I've written seven books, which have about 12 awards. Wow. And I go, I go around the world and I lecture on and do workshops on stress, mindfulness, mindset, communication, ego state optimization. Uh, of course, given what's going on in the world, you know, stress is always a topic, but it's uh, certainly on the tip of everyone's mind right now. So yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do. So I'm either one-on-one with clients in my office or up to, you know, 2,000 on one in, in the lectures that I do. So yeah, I love what I do. I love what I do. That's awesome. So of all those hats, you got, you got quite the hat rack to hang up at the end of the day. <laughs> Which came first? How, what what launched all of this? Yeah, you know, it's... I. I I just followed the breadcrumbs and I just said yes to opportunity. So I actually, of all things, I started out as an actor, which kind of circled back to the whole motivational speaking thing that came very naturally for me. But I actually started out as a massage therapist. I very accidentally um, apprenticed with a, a woman in college and I was in a show and she would show up every day and she'd work on the other students and I would watch her. I had nothing else to do during this particular show. And one day she said, oh, Kathy, I've got to go back to work. Can you take these masks and go in that other room and work on John? And I thought, she's crazy. Like, I'm an actor. What are, you know? <laughs> and I looked, I looked at her and I said, I don't know what I'm doing. And she looked at me and she said, yes, you do. And I had the sense to listen to her. So that launched my very informal uh, massage career. And when I left Pittsburgh and moved to California, I thought, oh, hey, I should actually formally study massage. That way, you know, I'll have uh, you know, something to do in between my award-winning film roles, you know, and uh, the film roles never came, but the massage therapy stuck. And so I've been doing it since. And then I expanded that into doing things like herbs and homeopathics and health consulting. I have done Reiki for years. And then I started doing more hypnosis. I started writing and I realized, you know, I really want to get back on stage. How can I combine everything I do? And so there's just this very natural unfolding from the healing and the performing. And so to me, it's like even, even being on your show, this is a perform. A, you know, a performance to a certain level of to, to be engaging and help educate people and be entertaining at the same time. So I love getting on stage. I think that's probably one of my favorite things still. Yeah. You know, at first glance, when you rattle them all off, it's hard to see how it makes sense. But now that you, you connected some of the dots, it, it does. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was not a straight line. Oh, sure. <laughs> by yeah, any means. It never, never really is. Um, and so this idea of being on stage, I want to touch on that because I feel that way often, you know, Mike, uh-huh. if it's in your career for anybody, right? When you go into the office, it's sort of going through the curtains and now you are the work version of yourself. You are enacting a role that you have to play. Yeah. So I just, and while this is top of mind, is I just finished reading a book not too long ago called The Alter Ego Effect. Oh. And I just found it fascinating because it goes more to the science of how you can use that idea of a performance and roles and alter egos. And so I'm just curious, uh-huh. someone like you that's up on stage all the time and giving these performances like you are right now, if you've tapped into that, if you've got an alter ego that you channel for these moments. Yeah. And it's funny that you asked that because one of the things that I'm really focused on right now, especially in my coaching is ego state, uh, ego state therapy. And so what that is, is basically what you're talking about. It's switching states. Um, so I absolutely have performance, Kathy, uh, when I'm you know either talking in this, in this environment or up on stage. And then next to performance, Kathy, I have these two other ego states. One is sort of the gesture that looks for opportunities to be funny, 
I get that from my father. I honed that from when I was a kid. And then on the other side of me is a sort of like researcher librarian kind of like, you know, go into the bowels of the library and find that fact, which sort of stands off to the other side of me and keeps me on track. So if I have to remember the name of a book or if I have to pull out a fact or if someone asks a question, I can feel like this researcher kind of take over and the, the comedic uh, lecturer kind of steps aside for a second. So I, I think we all have these, I mean, I know we do at five to 10 states that kind of we circle through all day long and we're aware of them. We kind of know when we switch them. Um, if you can map them and identify them and then you can call them up at will, we would be so much more productive and so much so much less fearful of things. You know, if we can call up that strong aspect of our personality that isn't afraid of public speaking to bring that forward rather than, you know, the scared little kid that's afraid they're going to get made fun of kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's such, such a great question. It's one of my favorite topics right now, obviously, because I've just babbled on about that way too long. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> Well, to keep going on that, then I'm curious how, you know, you said if you're uh -huh. aware of it, I would, I would argue that I think a lot of people aren't as aware of it, right? And so right. how can they become aware of it and start to channel it so that they can be the confident and not the scared kid? Yeah, sure. Well, I think once we know they exist, so just to say, hey, we have these five to 10 different aspects of our personality that we could call on, I think pretty much everybody would go, oh, yeah. You know, they realize when, you know, if something sparks anger or it, we've all had that moment where we go, oh, why did I say that? Or why did I react that way? That was a different ego state. That was a different part of us that came forward that isn't our, quote, normal executive ego state. So I think just being aware that it's a concept helps us. And then really sitting down and naming them. You know, um, I have what I call cranky pants. And it's my choice <laughs> if I want to put cranky pants. We, we all have cranky pants. They're very comfortable. We like the color. We've had them forever. Um, we choose whether we put that on in the morning, just like we choose which socks and shoes we wear. Um, so I think once we recognize that we have these different aspects and we can map them out and say, you know, we've got cranky pants. We've, I've got my Capricorn, who is the one that is that keeps me on track, that is on its shadow side can be way too pushy, um, way too driven, way too type A, way too cold. But on the plus side of the Capricorn, she keeps me, she's my drive. She keeps me at work. She keeps me focused. So once we realize we have all these different aspects, then we can basically negotiate with them and call forward what we need in any given situation. So if I'm going into a business meeting, I want part Cap you know, my Capricorn to come out, but I also want a little bit of my performer to come out too. I'm not going to bring the, um, you know, the very playful, like little kid personality that my boyfriend gets, because that's not going to go well in an executive meeting. <laughs> Sure. So it's a matter of making those choices. But once you know they're there, then you can choose differently. Yeah. And then you can have fun with it. Like you started to allude to, you can sort of create hybrid versions where it's a little of this, a little of that. Exactly. Yeah. So how does that play into the topic of stress, which I, which I know is a big topic of yours. You alluded to at the beginning. You know, right now we're recording this. It's April. When this goes live, I think it might be end of May, beginning of June. Mm -hmm. So we may or may not still be in the, in the, <laughs> in the throes of COVID-19. We're either still right. in it or just on the other side of it and still, you know, reflecting on all that's happened. How, how do ego states help you deal with stress of being cooped up in your house or fear to go outside and, you know, who's sick or who's not? Everything people uh -huh. are feeling right now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think we have different ego states that have different levels of fear. Um, I have scared little kid that doesn't like to be abandoned. And if she's triggered, then I start to get clingy and needy and feel that well, is no one paying attention to me kind of feeling, which I think, you know, we all kind of have scared little kid in us, whether it's from being drop off, dropped off at kindergarten the first time, which is not abusive. That's what has to happen. But some of us react differently to that than others or lost in the mall or truly abandoned by someone or, you know, God forbid, going through some abuse situation when we were kids. We all have some level of that abandoned kid feeling. And we also have someone who can comfort that scared kid. You know, that aspect of ourselves that if a little kid ran up to us in the mall, once we're done with social distancing, um, <laughs> and said, I'm scared, I can't find my mommy, how would you feel towards that child? Wouldn't you help that child or have some aspect of yourself that could, even if you're not a parent, parent that child and help them feel safe? We all have that aspect of ourselves. It might be more or less hidden in some of us, but if we can call on that, if we can self self soothe and actually call on that strong nurturing aspect of ourselves 
to help ourselves the way we would someone else, then that's an advantage we can take. So, and we all have that brave, you know, that thing we've overcome. And if we can tap into that and whether it's closing your eyes and going back to that, that revivification that we call it of reliving that moment when you were strong, when you were in charge, where you were fearless, we can tap back into that, anchor that into our bodies and help us, help us deal with that stress and that fear. Because I think especially with the COVID thing, it's not just stress. It's also the fear of that unknown. So to a certain extent, we ha- have had that combo of, you know, maybe minor stresses and minor minor fear, but this is an extreme case. And there's so many unknowns right now. There's so many what ifs. And there's an aspect of ourselves that can handle that. There's an aspect of ourselves that have overcome this sort of thing before. Just like in our office, you know, Bob always gets stuff done. We know if we give Bob the project, it's going to get finished. It's going to be right. So we call on Bob to do that thing. Um, We have that aspect in ourselves. And even if it was a, a smaller example of that situation, we can all think about a time that we have overcome something rough, that we have handled something. We have that strong aspect of ourselves. And even you know, we can go back and what we call revivify that, where we can experience that again. We can think about that, what the situation was, how we handled it, and anchor that in so we can call on that again, just the way we would calling on Bob in the office. So that's one of the ways that the whole ego state thing can can feature into the stress. Um, it helps us overcome by calling into that strong aspect of ourselves. Yeah, that really reminds me of like uh, like a mindfulness practice, right, where you realize you're you are not your emotions. You know, you can be an observer of what's going on. You don't have to give into it. And then you can acknowledge it and let it pass if it doesn't serve you. It's sort of like that with the ego you call on. If the wrong one's showing up, you can kind of kick him to the back seat and call forward Bob to get it done. Right. Absolutely. And at some point we have to maybe do um, some negotiation with those. So like occasionally I will wake up in the middle of the night and scheduler would like to chat scheduler would like to think about all those things we've got to do tomorrow and though i appreciate scheduler i need scheduler i don't need scheduler at three o'clock in the morning so i have to say to scheduler hey i appreciate what you're doing i know you serve a really specific purpose however we've got rest um that would actually like to be executive right now rest make sure all of us are taken care of so if we could rest now and i promise you as soon as we wake up We can continue this conversation and get stuff done. Before I even get halfway through that negotiation, I'm back to sound asleep. Um, So, you know, the the work and play are two that are often in conflict. Um, And any time that we've said, oh, I hate when I act like that. I don't know why I said that. That means there's two ego states in conflict that need to be kind of talked to. And that typically takes takes another person to do. (laughs) You can't often do that with yourself. Um, But I've done so much of this work, I found a way to, to... you know, be able to do that negotiation. Um, But yeah, we don't want the wrong thing out at the wrong time. That uh, that tends to cause problems. Yeah, that negotiation reminds me a lot of the conversations I have with my two-year-old when I'm trying to put him to bed and he wants to do anything else. (laughs) Exactly. So how do you respond to people that might say, okay, Kathy, I get it, right? I get what you're saying, but that sounds an awful lot to me like multiple personality disorder or someone with schizophrenia and these people we lock up, you're telling me I need to talk to rest and scheduler like this sounds nuts what do you get any of that when you're speaking and and how do you respond to that yeah so when i do the introduction to ego state whether i'm talking to an individual or a whole audience i actually compare it to multiple personality disorder and i say here's how it's different We know we have these different aspects of ourselves. We have the ability to talk to these different aspects of ourselves. With multiple personality disorder, you don't. You might wake up in the morning and wonder why you have on that strange lipstick and why you have a paycheck with a different name and why all of your friends are suddenly calling you Mary. Um, It's a a not knowing that there are these different aspects of you. Whereas this ego state, and this is actually backed by science. These These are specifically wired in our brain to have these different aspects of ourselves. And they're formed in childhood. So if you look at it that way of, you know, these are just things that we grew in ourselves to deal with various situations. You know, it's like the class clown who realized, you know, he gets more attention if he's funny. It's the um, Chandler Bing thing of he covers everything on friends. He covers everything up with humor. That's a very specific ego state he developed as a defense mechanism. And we all have them. And I think if we just sit down and think about that, we can, you know, go, oh, yeah, I kind of do have these different parts. Yeah, it's interesting. Especially, like I said, I have a two-year-old. So now I'm thinking about, well, geez, how can I cultivate the quote unquote correct ego states for my son, right? But there really isn't anything that's correct. I'm sure is what you're going to say. It's, it is what it is for each of us. And then it's just how we learn to harness them, I'm sure. Exactly. And depending on how, you know, what happens to us in our childhood is what grows out of that. 
you know, um, we form our ego states in childhood. So your son is probably still putting them all together. So encouraging all that health and, and open communication and that security is going to be better for him. Yeah. And that word health, that's something else I was curious about in, in looking at your profile is the health side of things. And Mm -hmm. how does, you know, the relationship between health and stress and ego states, I suppose all of it, but I'm sure you're getting a lot of that right now too. People stuck in the house, just eating a lot of chocolate because why not? It feels good, right? Um, right. Put, putting on your cranky pants that are comfortable and eating chocolate that's comfortable. Um, how, what's the relationship there between what we eat, how we feel, and how we show up in the world? Oh, that's so huge. And, you know, stress right now is responsible, probably even more now, but 60 to 80% of our doctor's visits are from stress-related illness. So to the extent that we can help curb our stress and manage our stress, we're going to be healthier. Stress, and this is, this is sort of the ironic thing, stress overall depletes our immune system. So we are so worried about getting sick, but yet worrying about getting sick actually allows us to get more sick. <laughs> so to the extent that we can, you know, maybe do an affirmation, you were talking about mindfulness meditation, which is a great, absolute great thing. I'm a huge fan of meditation, whatever version of it you do. And I, there's just so many, um, but doing affirmations, saying things like I am healthy and well, my immune system is strong and resilient actually boosts our immune system. Studies support visualizing and affirming can actually change our physiology. Um, And also when we're stressed, we tend to make, we want to be soothed. We want to change those chemicals in our brain. And that comes from eating, drinking, drugs, sex, gambling, you know, all those immediate dopamine things. Uh, This is one of the things that's huge with social media right now. I didn't get very many likes on that Facebook page. And we feel bad about it because we don't get that dopamine hit every time that little thumb goes up, you know? Um, So it's just feeding our brain a different thing to try to make ourselves feel better. And some people eat and some people drink and some people dance. So, you know, there's, we all have that, what gives us that zing. And so many of us don't have that normal zing. I mean, I'm usually in dance class five nights a week. Well, no dance class right now. I do trapeze, no trapeze right now. So what can I do to fulfill that need for movement, that need for dance and activity while we're in quarantine? And it's about being flexible, pivoting, making different choices and giving yourself a break too. You know, I had three of the mini Reese's peanut butter cups earlier. I'm not going to beat myself up over that. (laughs) What's funny is actually, so did I. The exact same amount and thing. I have a couple in my fridge. I like them when they're cold, and I had some. After yeah, dinner. yeah. I feel better about those because they're small. So I feel like I can have three, and it's not even a full one. At least that's what I tell right. myself. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I like to look at that kind of thing as a treat, not a cheat. Because everyone's like, oh, I'm having a cheat day. It's like, oh, but that makes it sound like you're doing something wrong. Make it a treat. Um, you know, and also we really have to be gentle with ourselves during this time of quarantine because this is, like I said before, like nothing we've ever seen before. This is this is not normal. This is not even a new normal yet. Um, so, we, you know, we're probably sleeping more. We're eating in ways that we are not used to eating. Um, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. We just have to be, I think, give ourselves a break on this too. Yeah, so what are some ways that you've pivoted during all of this? You mentioned not being able to trapeze, which I feel like could be a whole other podcast, how you got into trapeze. <laughs> um, well, it's a story. What are you doing, yeah. in, what are you doing instead? Uh, well, I'm sitting in my living room right now looking at trapeze hanging from the ceiling. So I uh, was able to mount that, probably much to my landlord's dismay. Um, so, yeah, you know, I've been walking more. Uh, I've been doing some dance classes on Zoom. But basically, most of my careers sort of disappeared in one fell swoop. You know, all the conferences that I was scheduled to do aren't happening. So I lost out on a lot of my speaking work. And my massage practice is shut down because we're not allowed to be within six feet of someone. And I haven't figured out how to do you know, virtual massage yet. So <laughs> massage, I, massage yeah. robots, right? That you can, massage uh, robot. Yeah. It doesn't feel the same. They're a little, they're a little pokey. So, um, you know, I'm essentially unemployed, which is also sort of a, it's such a different state for me because I'm self-employed when I work and don't work is really up to me. So to basically be forced into a 70 day weekend <laughs> is, is, really odd for me. And I went through various stages of beating myself up and guilt and I should be doing more and I need to get online and I need to do more ads. And, you know, it's interesting. I've gone through just this, these various phases of the heck am I doing with myself? Um, and then I'm waiting until everything opens up again. So, you know, it's, it depends on the moment of the day. And I think we're all going through that too. We have moments of I'm going to do this thing and we feel great about it. And then, you know, the next day we wake up and we put on our cranky pants and we eat 20 Reese's peanut butter cups instead of three. (laughs) It's almost, like the, uh, it's almost like the stages of grief. Like we've all lost oh, something yeah. and yeah. it's just coming to terms with that for what yeah. the new normal is, even if it's a normal for a week, you know, it's, 
the the here and now versus what we were thinking of the here and now to be. Right. And for someone like myself, who's very type A and who is very self-starter and, you know, I'm looking to what some of my colleagues are doing and it's like, you know, they've 100% pivoted and they're doing all these webinars and they're busier than ever and they're making millions of dollars. And I'm sitting at home going, well, I was going to maybe do a Facebook ad. And I was starting to beat myself up that I wasn't productive or as innovative or as technological as them. And I realized, you know, I, I can do that. But what purpose does that serve? Let's move forward from here. I can't undo the past. I can't go back two weeks and do something differently, not manage time travel yet, working on it. Um, so what can I do moving forward to serve people to make sure that I'm getting my message out and so that I can pick up when everything does resume and, you know, go back to what I what I love to do and how I can help people. Yeah. So can you give us an example of how you've done that? How are you serving people right now? Yeah. So I, on Facebook every day, I do a daily pause and where it's just, you know, anywhere from like one to three minutes of just a life lesson or a meditation or something to think about or something to consider. Um, I brought those back. I was doing them pretty consistently for a year, year and a half. And I just kind of phased out of it. I didn't feel it very posy. So I stopped. And once this ha- this started, I realized now people were really looking forward to those. Uh, I just started a Facebook group uh, called the Empowerment Project, where I literally just did this a couple hours ago. And I'm inviting people in to discuss stress and how to overcome obstacles and things like that. And I'm really getting my coaching practice together, which is, you know, can be online centric. I don't have to have somebody in my office because I realize, unfortunately, with my professions, it's all about interpersonal connectivity, which is great until we're not allowed to connect with people personally. And so um, I'm really working on getting some online stuff going. And and the main focus of that is going to be the coaching. Great. And I love that word empowerment. I feel like a lot of what you described with the, the ego states comes down to empowerment. It's realizing you have these tools at your disposal in which you can empower yourself to have the best version of yourself present at any given moment. I think that's, that's a powerful phrase. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to me, it's all about choice. You know, my, my um, daily pause today was about cranky pants. <laughs> and I literally walked outside, still in my robe, no hair and makeup done, plopped into my garden. And I talked about how, you know, I woke up this morning and I wanted to put on my cranky pants. And I realized, you know, that's a choice. And we all have a choice. And we don't have a choice as to what's going on externally. We can't change this whole COVID thing. We can't change whether our job is going to be there or not. We can't change whether we're working right now. But what we can change and what we can choose to do is change our minds about things and make different choices. And that's always within our power. So anytime somebody says, well, I don't have a choice, you absolutely do. Um, we, with every exhale, we have the ability to make a different choice as to how we live our lives, how we think about things and how we relate to other people. That's always within our power. And so that's one of the things I encourage people to do is make those different choices. Hmm. I love that little soundbite there with every exhale, we have the chance to make a different choice. That's, that's good. So if you had to make a choice, if you had to choose just three words that summarized your entire journey on this planet thus far from massage to trapeze and everything in between, what three words would you choose? Go for it. Go for it. That's, I like it. That's that's an easy one. That's when I did my TEDx. That was one of the stories I told that's on my license plate. It was my high school motto. Uh, I don't know where it came from. I certainly didn't coin the phrase. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it's about just going for it, taking that leap, taking that step. That's what the trapeze is about. It's a mindfulness practice, but it's also a parallel for life because we all – at some point, find ourselves standing on that little platform with the choice of, do I jump off or not? And you have to remember, there's always a net and there's always someone to catch you. So yeah, go for it. That's my, those are my three words. And so you really, I mean, I know you didn't coin the phrase. Can you think back to where that might've come from? You mentioned that one version of your ego came from one of your parents. When you were growing up, was somebody always pressing you to go for it and you just sort of absorbed it? Or is it something oh. you just sort of tripped over? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, that, I think that was what was under my my face my uh, my Facebook didn't have Facebook back then. My yearbook picture. <laughs> I think my you know this is what your phrase go for it. I don't know. I think that was always my attitude of what can I do next? What now? What next mountain can I climb? I'm so very Capricorn in that way. Um, and I just think I was always the adventurer. I was probably the, you know, the little kid that was constantly running away from her parents to explore something. So, you know, I don't know exactly where it came from, but it just always seemed to be a part of my personality that let's try something new. Oh, I'll go do that. I say yes to everything, um, you know, within reason, of course, but uh, that's just sort of the per- aspect of myself that developed over the years. My dad was kind of the adventurous one. Um, my mother was the scared one. So I had two very different ego-stated parents at any given time. But yeah, and no, I think I, I, if anything, I got it more from my dad. 
Yeah, I just find that interesting because I have a TED Talk coming up whenever COVID is over. Uh, <laughs> that it got postponed. And I wrote a book on this, on the same topic, and it's similar. I call it Unseen Work. And one of the types of unseen work I call generational unseen work. And it's that idea uh-huh. that, you know, we have this foundation of all these things we don't even see. And it's everything our parents and grandparents did and their parents and grandparents yeah. and beyond. And going back to what you said about how things are cultivated in childhood, so much, if you really sit and do the work and think about it, you can really point to a lot of your own personality traits or even catchphrases like go for it to even just watching someone in your family go after it themselves. And it just sort of gets wired and wired in you without you even seeing it or even being aware of it. It's interesting. Yeah, totally. And, and I mean, if you, and I completely agree with that, it is about sitting there and looking back at it. And if I look to, you know, I love jokes. I love laughing. I love doing improv. I have a good sense of humor. I have a very quick mind. So, I mean, I did improv for years and I know very consciously that I got that from my dad. I observed him in groups of people. He was very quick witted. He was very, he never missed an opening. If there was a good one liner zinger, he was amazingly quick on his feet. He was incredibly clever and man, could the guy tell a joke. And I very specifically chose to follow that. Um, because I saw how people responded to him when he was in that personality and it made him very likable. It made him very relatable. It made him very friendly. My dad was just sort of the salt of the earth guy. Um, everybody loved him. And so as a kid, I remember going, huh, that's working. I think I'm going to do that. And I specifically emulated that. I was never the class clown, but I was definitely the one that had a zinger if the opportunity presented itself. And I know, I know consciously I got that from my dad. So I agree with you. I think if we look back, we can see where those things came from. And I really want to read your book. That sounds awesome. And oh, congrats thanks. on the TED Talk. Yeah, now I'm sitting here wondering, what do I do with the books? I wanted to do the book after the TED Talk, so I could say it was based on the talk. People watch the mm-hmm. video. I can point them towards it. And we'll just see how long this goes for. I might do the book first because I'm just itching, yeah. to, itching to get it out there. Yeah, absolutely do it. Now's a good time. We're all sitting at home. <laughs> yeah, all right. And so you mentioned looking back. If we, uh, if we look forward... Mm-hmm. And as everyone looks forward, you know, post COVID and whatever, you know, because I feel like you could you could change out the word COVID-19 or coronavirus for the next thing. Right. This isn't going to be the last time something like this happens. So as we look forward to what we can do to be more empowered, what's a piece of advice you want to leave the listeners to wrap up the podcast? Yeah, I think it's just, again, about that all we all have choices and whether you're right, whether it's COVID or coronavirus or the next recession or the next election or that, you know, there's constantly going to be changes in our environment that we cannot control, that we do not have the ability to change. But we always have a choice, again, of how we're thinking, of how we're responding to those things. And I think if we remember that responding is so much healthier than reacting, uh, you know, we want first responders, not first reactors. Um, I love If that. we look at it that yeah. way, if we just take that pause and respond. I think we'll all be better off uh, just taking that breath and saying, let me just have a second on this and then taking action on it. I don't think we give ourselves enough pause because it's the it's the silence in between the notes that make the music it's not just the sound um so i think sometimes we just have to be silent and in that silence there's power to make a different choice love it you were full of sound bites on this talk this is great <laughs> how very kamala harris of me <laughs> <laughs> so as people people listen to this and they want more kathy groover where can we where can we send them yeah. Um, so kathygroover.com. It's Kathy with a K and Groover, U-V-E-R. kathygroover.com has everything about my speaking and all of my books. And then kathygroover.coach is where you can actually work with me. And um, I know this isn't going to be coming out for a while, but I've got a sliding scale and stuff because of COVID because I know so many people are suffering and, and need the help right now. And that's what I want to be there. I want to be there to support that. So Awesome. Well, we will send them your way. I appreciate your time on the podcast. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, that's a wrap for this episode of Relish the Journey, but we'll be back next week with much more. And a very, very special thank you to Kathy Gruber for being our guest. She was full of sound bites. I was taking notes the whole time. I loved it. Hope you guys did too. And if you did, I hope that you share this podcast with somebody that you know that could benefit from the message. If not this one, another one. That's how we spread this mantra of Relish the Journey and grow our tribe of travelers, as I like to call it. So make sure you like the podcast, subscribe to the podcast, leave me a review, shoot me an email. You can reach me at miles, M-Y-L-E-S, at rtjmedia.com. Until next time, everyone, cheers.